Hi, Don. Welcome to the show. Well, hello, John. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Oh, well, I appreciate having you on. I was looking at uh, your body of work. My goodness, you've written a lot of books over the time. And we're going to get to as many of those as you wish. It's really up to you what you, what you want to tell me about. But um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself first, your backstory, where you come from, and how you got to this point. Well, it's pretty interesting. Uh, so I have lived in uh, Houston, Texas for 45 years before I moved here to New Braunfels. And uh, while in Houston, early in my working career, I had a very long commute down uh, with, I, I think it's like Highway 6 over Attic's Dam, nice forested area. And, you know, I just started daydreaming. And the daydream grew. It was on this one particular book. It was one of my, well, my actual uh, first science fiction book that used to be called Second Chance, which is now Prophecy of Fall. So every day I had a pad of paper in the passenger seat and I would scratch things out, get to work. And I really hate to say this, but, you know, I used their computer to type notes. <laughs> Sorry about that, stealing time. But uh, so I started that in 1979 and I finished that book in, I think like uh, 1984. And then I found a critique group to help me, you know, figure out what to do with this clump of words that I had. Yeah. And uh, that's when it all started, you know, and uh, it took me several years to, revamp that book because I'll tell you the very first uh the very first edition my uh character cried about 85 percent through the book you know and I didn't know any better you know I didn't know how to write I had no clue and then I started my career as a technical writer and that's where I really learned how to put things together uh, it's a very disciplined career. You know, you you work for uh, you work towards a an outline and a deadline, and that helped my uh, creative writing career so much. I am so grateful for the thirty four years that I worked as a technical writer. Interesting. Yeah. So, you know, the the publishing date line is okay. So I was thirty one when I started writing. And then uh, there's a distinction between the first book I wrote and the first book published. So the first book I wrote was Second Chance Prophecy of Thal. And uh, I published it 33 years later. Right. You know, I went through so many rewrites on that thing that, and it sat in a drawer for a long time because I was just intimidated. And then the the first book I published was uh, my only hardcover book, nonfiction, called The Puppy Baby Book. And that is a fill-in-the-blanks baby book for anyone who wants to adopt a puppy. And it's their first year that you document. And that thing's been, been selling since uh, 1999. And it won an award. So it tells you that I'm doing something right. And uh, I'm really grateful that it's, you know, I'm not making a fortune on it, but it, it it's selling, you know, and the longevity is just unbelievable because typically there's like a five-year lifespan for a book like that. You mentioned Thal, but I see that uh, there's a whole series with that word in it. Uh, what's that all about? Prophecy of Fall was the very first book, and uh, it's another one of my fantasies. Uh, basically, a 17-year-old girl in uh, Katy, Texas, which is west of Houston on I-10. Uh, well, let me back up. Uh, when she was 12 years old, she and her mother and her two little brothers were in an accident in the, the family's minivan, a uh, an 18-wheeler jumped the medium and crashed into their vehicle. And uh, Delane Jackson, who is the, the hero of the 17-year-old, uh, her legs were almost cut off. The dashboard just, you know, 
fell into her, right. her lungs. So she was in the hospital for uh, quite a long time in a coma. And uh, she had uh, two broken legs. Uh, they had to repair, you know, all these things in her body, broken arms and collarbone and all the stuff. And her mom died in that accident. Both of her brothers in the back seat were okay in their child seats. So while she was in the hospital in this coma, she started having uh, nightmares of these four beings. One was uh, what she thought was uh, like a, a prince, a young prince. One was this uh, alligator man with a human eye, with a human form, and uh, you know he threatened her. And then there was a black robot in a human form that uh, scared her half to death. And then there was this white furred creature with red eyes that basically soothed her so when she came out of the coma she came out of it screaming her lungs out and her father who is a nasa scientist was convinced that all that started in the coma but none of the you know psychologists the doctors or anything anybody else would you know buy into that so here we are five years later she's getting ready to go off to college she's at the mall with her father and brothers and uh, she's walking to the minivan uh, to let the, the heat out. And this cloud conversion comes through. It drops to the ground. When it backs up and goes, no delaying. She's gone. She is pulled into Thal. And we discover that they have been waiting for her for eons of time. But the, the Egrams, the white creatures, uh, they were really upset because they were expecting a a warrior and here's this teenager so that's you know that's how that uh that whole series started and uh yeah i'm five books into it now there's uh prophecy of thal there's gifts from thal love of thal the king of thal, king of thal. and then earth calling thal wow yeah so thal, thal is a place thal is a place yeah. I see. I see. You know, once you think it, you create it. <laughs> well, sure, of course. Yeah, and and this idea came to you in '79, and that's when you first started writing these this first story of Saul. Yeah, that that I'm took me forever. You yeah, know? I'm wondering how did you figure that at in '79? Where did where were you hoping to go? I mean, now it's relatively easy to self publish, very difficult to sell, but you can self publish. Where, what were you thinking in '79? Well, I'll tell you, uh, by the late 80s, when I, I thought I had it in good shape, which, believe me, it was horrible, I started, you know, writing letters to, uh, this is, you know, before email and everything, so I started writing letters to uh, editors and publishers, reject, 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 I mean, I could paper my whole house with with all the rejects, you know. Mm -hmm. And so then I, you know, I let it set aside for a while and I would, you know, rework it every once in a while and uh, try it again, you know, reject, 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 you know, <laughs> you mm. have to have very thick skin, very yep. thick skin, yeah, you know, sure. because it's hard not to take that personal. Uh, so I figured that, you know, there was still more work to do on it. And so another decade goes by, you know, and I'm rewriting it again. And in the meantime, I'm writing, you know, uh, cozy mysteries. I started on my hot chocolate series. I saw that too. Yeah, yeah that's uh, the Alcott Family Adventures and it's mm -hmm. uh, the hot chocolate series. Uh, so then, you know, uh, after a time I decided, well, let's see. Um, okay, so I published Prophecy of Thal in uh, September of uh, 2017. Uh, I actually started publishing uh, my own work in the early 2000s because I determined, okay, I'm aging here and I have given it my best shot to, you know, try to contact editors and publishers. And even after some of my work had 
won awards. You know, they were not interested whatsoever. And so I, I you know, this is in the early days of self-publishing. And, and I thought, well, you know, what do I have to lose? You know, uh, back then, self-publishing had a very bad reputation, you know, like only losers, you know, self-published is basically the way you felt, you know. <laughs> But that has really changed over, you know, the past decade. And from what I understand, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, authors from big publishing companies have dumped them and are now self-publishing their own work. I've met a few myself. Yeah. And I, I think they should, you know, because it, it's really shameful the way the big, you know, publishing companies treat their people that you know they're the ones that are paying them for crying out loud you know yeah. their book sales pay their salaries yeah so yeah. It, it reminds <laughs> me so much of the music industry as you can tell i'm, I'm a musician i went uh, semi-pro in the 80s and eventually you know became independent uh, i did independent releases as did so many other people so by the time i got to this self-publishing uh, part of our uh, times it sounds very familiar to me you know, mm -hmm. something that we were doing as musicians 20, 30 years ago, for sure. Yeah, it, it's a it's a tough thing being artistic in any realm. You know, it, it's uh, it's really difficult. But, you know, those that stick with it, regardless of what anybody says, uh, we're the ones that win in the long run. Yeah. So you've written quite a few and you'd like to seem you seem to write write series and you have a variety of different genres you cover as well. Mm -hmm. Where do you get your incentive to keep going? Well, what else would I do? Good answer. That that's it. You know, what else would I do? You know, I'm not going to be sitting on the porch drinking a you know, a iced tea and rocking in the rocking chair. I'm that's not the way I'm made. You know, my my brain is just so active, and stories come to me. I have file folders filled with little pieces of paper or long sheets of paper with all kinds of story ideas. I, yeah. You know, and there's just no way I'm ever going to get to them. So. I write what I love, you know, and that that's my whole attitude. Well, you know, I'm writing for me. If you like it, yay team. You know, mm -hmm. if you buy it, yay team, you know, yeah. but uh, if, if you're writing something just because you think you're going to get rich from it, good luck with that. Yeah. You know? I mean, I've, a lot of my books have won awards and you know, it just doesn't make any difference uh, unless you are out there marketing. Mm -hmm. And I'm one of the, you know, invisible ones because I just, you know, I don't know anything at all about marketing. The only thing I do is uh, my newsletter and sending out emails. And anytime I send out a puppy baby book, they get a postcard in there. Now, some people that I've talked to who uh, have written as many books as you have, Perhaps they didn't start so early, and I get I get the impression from them that they're they're pumping out three books, three four books a year, and the moment mm -hmm. they write it, it all goes off to the editor, and it just gets taken care of there, and then they're just writing the next book. Is mm -hmm. that not what you do as well? Do you do you nurse it right to the end before you send it off to an editor? Yeah, I, I go through my own uh, editing first. You know, I'm not just a, you know, spell check, you know. Yeah. Uh, I do a deep dive and try to, you know, fix it as much as I possibly can. And then it goes off to an editor and then I'll get those changes. And, you know, if I agree with them, I'll make changes. We may have a discussion about, you know, like, well, what, where did this come from, you know? Mm -hmm. And then after I've made the changes, then I do one step further. I hire a proofreader right. because you've got to have eyes you know and even with all that i've recently just uh updated a couple of books where you know what i like to do is i will read one of my books either on my tablet or a paperback and uh i'll find errors you know and it's like god almighty how did that happen so many <laughs> eyes on these books i mean yeah uh, so i the latest book is um the detectives. I can't show you this one because it's got the wrong cover on it, but uh, that's in my Cats is Cat series. And uh, 
Oh, the other night I, I thought, well, you know, I'll, I'll just sit down and I'll, I'll read through this, you know, uh, because by the end of the year, I'll be probably starting on the fourth book. And I'm circling things. It's like, what in the world? You know, every five pages, I'm circling something. And so I, you know, fixed that and uploaded a new version, waited the 72 hours that, yeah. you know, ADP tells you. Yeah. Uh, so thankfully, sometimes it isn't 72, you know. Right. So, so you're doing mainly through KDP? That and Smashwords. Okay. Yeah, and with Smashwords, you get off to, uh, they have other retailers that they send to. So that's why I think that's so attractive. Uh, right. You get uh, to several different companies. I saw the chili pepper with the chocolate. I almost want to eat that. <laughs> I know, it looks pretty good, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You want to talk about that series a little bit? It, it's a fun, cozy mystery series, and... Uh, that's set in Houston, Texas, in uh, the exclusive River Oaks area where, you know, there's the, there are the big mansions. And the Alcott sisters are in their 60s. They are very quirky, very weird. They consider their housekeeper, you know, their housekeepers or their, their chefs, their best friends, you know, and they sit down and eat with them, which nobody else would ever do you know in that community so uh their father is uh the uh well he's uh, 92 bernie alcott and he is the one who started alcott chocolates and he's a billionaire and uh when you first meet him in hot chocolate you think he's infirm he's you know got maybe dementia or something because uh he's living with uh the younger daughter, Dorothea, uh, who's the, I think she's uh, in her early 60s. And uh, his nurse, Bambi, is, uh, she's, uh, wears a skin tight little nurse's outfit with a little hat and uh, yeah. boobs sticking out, stuff like yeah. that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the sisters are fed up with, you know, the way things are going. Dorothea doesn't want to take care of him anymore. And Lila May, who's the main character, you know, has a hissy fit and says, you know, we tried to warn you years ago that, you know, we should put him in assisted living, you know. So they have a, uh, a meeting with their solicitor. And uh, he sets up a place for Bernie to go to this exclusive, uh, you know, what do you call them? Um, nursing home, I suppose. Yeah, it's not an assisted living. Assisted. You know, very very upscale. You know, and he's got a penthouse up there now. Uh, well, come to find out, his relationship with Bambi was a little bit more than uh, what you thought, and uh, so through the process of this, uh, you learn that uh, Bambi's husband, Jimmy Ray Shalane. Uh, who owns the bowling alley and is really quite uh, brilliant as far as uh, doing stocks and bonds and things like that. Uh, so I know I'm wandering all over the place here. I'm I'm terrible about. Well, you're telling me about your book, basically. So Jimmy Ray gets killed, and all the fingers are pointing at Bambi. You know, uh, and then, you know, everybody gets involved uh, in the family because, you know, Bernie's on the outskirts here. Lila May's boyfriend is the detective. His name is Chance. And he finds out uh, that the murder weapon was actually a fork, a very special fork from Dorothea's house. Mm. Yeah, so it's a uh, fun read, though, because you're going but to... But a mystery at the same time, by the sounds of it. Yes, so you're going to, you know, get the quirkiness of the family, and they are quirky, you know, right, like you right. cannot believe. And then you're going to get the mystery. Let's jump around, because I see something in front of me here. That you had two versions. You have one that was just simply called Mastering Your Money, and then you have the 2022 edition of Mastering Your Money, I suppose... 
that something like that needs to be updated regularly. Yeah. How did you jump around to that? That's, that sounds like a pretty well, straightforward stuff. <laughs> this is pretty interesting. So back when I worked, uh, my very first technical writing job was at Compact Computer. And, uh, you know, back then, uh, there was a couple of people that spent one paycheck a month on bounce check charges. They didn't know what they were doing. And I was a checkbook wizard. And so I'm explaining, you know, what they need to do, you know, to straighten themselves out. And one of them brilliantly says, well, Dawn, you should write that down. And so it started off as no more bounce checks. And then it went through several different uh, names. And then, uh, yeah, it ended up as Mastering Your Money. The paperback came out in uh, 2009, and then the ebook didn't come out until 2011. That actually won uh, an award. You know, and the funny thing about it is I, I tried sending, you know, the book to uh, agents and publishers, you know, to see if they'd be interested in that. And some of the things that I got back were, well, you know, you're not a finance, you know, there's no initials after your name. So after I won the award, I did the nasty thing of sending emails to those people and saying the book you didn't want just won this award, mm. you know. Thank you very much, you know, mm -hmm. so yeah, uh, it has to be updated uh, every once in a while. And what I'm actually working on right now is something that spun off of that. And it's called What's Breaking Your Budget. I published that back in 2017. And I'm in the process of updating it because so many things have changed. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And the budgets... Uh, that I had in there, I, I have you know uh, a budget to show people, and then I've got examples of expenses and uh, you know all these things that you really need to think of because the top budgets only cover you know rent or the mortgage and car payment and utilities and food, you know things like that. But there's there's a world of things that you shell money out for, and everybody in your household that you support shells out money and none of that stuff ever lands in your budget. And so when you get to the point where, you know, things are bouncing or, you know, uh, you're just really racked up with credit card debt. Yeah. And that's when you have to really sit down and take notice, you know, how can I turn this around? Well, that's yeah. what this book's about. Sure, sure. As you can see, it's tiny. It it's very small, tiny. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't believe in uh, stuffing all this, all this, you mm -hmm. know, extraneous information. People want the information. Yeah. And that's it, what I give them. Can it help people who uh, live paycheck to paycheck and are wondering how to get out of that uh, cycle? Yes. Yes. I mean, sometimes yeah. it's yeah. not possible, but maybe sometimes it is because of bad spending. Yes, and this also won uh, a gold medal. And so, you don't have letters at, at at the end of your name. Imagine that. I don't. No, it's just me. <laughs> is is this stuff you practice yourself? Yes, yes. Okay. So that's how you know. Staying on this kind of subject, uh, another nonfiction book that I see, and I have a think. I think I know why you wrote this. How to format Word docs like a pro. Now, uh, being a, a writer, you probably had to use Word and figure out how to use it like a pro. Is that how it came about? Well, I've been using Word since, oh gosh, I don't know, uh, the 80s. Sure. You know, through technical writing, because that's the standard that people in the business use is Microsoft Word. And yeah, there are so many little tips and tricks and things and you know, it's just, uh, it's really difficult. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I tell people in the book is that, you know, you have to look at your version of Word and your computer version. You get out there and you Google these things to make sure that 
you can find on the menu of your program where things are hidden because it, it's not straight across the board. Things on my Macintosh are different on a PC mm -hmm. uh, for those different versions of Word. But I teach people how to really make great looking documents, how to use styles. Some people have never even heard of the word styles before. What do you mean by styles, you know? Yeah. Uh, and it's, you know, it's a very worthwhile book. I mean, I would love to be able to get this into every, you know, every school in the nation because their students really need it when they go out into the world, you know, because if you're going to work in an office, most of the times you're going to be using Microsoft Word and sure. you don't want to have your documents look, you know, junky. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Let's flip through a few more things here. Uh, okay, here's one called Forced Dreams. What's that about? Well, I'll tell you that uh, I published that in 2018. And uh, basically, that was, you know, from a dream that I had. And uh, it's uh, very science fiction-y uh, about a woman who has these dreams about this man that she doesn't know who he is. And uh, she's a widow with two young boys. And she's uh, driving to work one day. Uh, and this is also set in Houston on this really curvy road. And her car just, you know, starts faltering. So she pulls over to the side and this uh, sports car drives past, stops and backs up to her. And the guy gets out of the car and it's him. And then he shows up in uh, dreams and in almost like uh, holographic things in front of her. Mm. And so it takes off from there. I like some of these covers. Breaking Bad Habits. Where did you get the cover for that? Different yeah, stuff. it's it's uh, it's one of my notebooks and... Uh, you know, I, I went out there and I found an image and just, you know, slapped it on there. Okay. Uh, and the funny thing about the notebooks is, uh, okay, so these are blank books. Uh, the very first page or two or three pages in the notebook will tell you, you know, what you need to do, you know, okay. uh, how you uh, can write things down to help yourself and all this. And uh, on... Amazon, it says that these are filling, you know, you fill them in. And I had this one guy write me a nasty note and a nasty review saying, this woman has a hell of a nerve to put her name on this book because it's a blank book. And I told him, I said, well, first of all, uh, Amazon wants a name on a book. They don't care what kind of a book it is. You've got to have your name on there. Yeah. Second of all, the description tells you that it is you know, this is not a book telling you how to break your bad habits. It's a book telling you to write down your bad habits and examine things, you know. Uh, so I, I had to cut and paste the uh, the information from Amazon and send it to him. And that shut him up. You know, it's like for crying out loud, just because you have poor reading skills doesn't mean that, you know, you need to beat me up about it. One of my best selling notebooks is what to do when a loved one dies. That's been selling uh, pretty steadily. And uh, I have a 10 page list in the beginning of that notebook. Uh, I think there's like 35 or 36 different things that people need to, you know, see if they need to attend to those things for their loved one or whoever it was that passed away. Because, you know, when someone passes away, who's ever left is, is you know, they're nervous wrecks and yeah. they're grieving and they don't know what to do and uh, they need guidance. And so this is uh, something that uh, they can do for themselves. And, you know, uh, the way I have the pages set up is, you know, you can write the task number up there, the date, who you talk to, what, you know, what transpired that way there, you know, later you can, if somebody questions you in the family or something, 
you can go back and say, well, you know, I talked to Joe Smith over here and I this see. is what he told me, you know? I see. Yeah. yeah. Well, interesting. I never heard of uh, books like that. So there is some writing in it uh, that sort of guides you, but you're, you're doing most of the work, right? Yes, you're doing most of the work. You're making sure that, you know, you are on track and you're not overlooking something, you know, and I tell people, do the legal things first and then everything else comes after, you know. Uh, so it, it's I'm, a really I'm, good idea. I'm seeing this as a very good idea because, well, for that topic or for other topics, Breaking Bad mm -hmm. Habits, of course, uh, you have a book. It, it's it's not just like a notebook or loose pieces of paper or, you know, journaling. It's it's it's, it's actually a book with a spine that has a title on it and everything. Yeah. Great, great stuff. I'm very impressed with that. It's cool. Thank you. You have a book called Mindfulness. Talk to me about that. It's one of the, the notebooks. So basically it's learn to become mindful about everything that passes through your mind and around you, your feelings, what your body experiences, how the surrounding environment affects you. Tune into nature. This journal gives you the space to jot these things down on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's uh, 120 pages, blank pages. Do you know of anyone else who does this kind of uh, blank page notebook type of things? Not really. And I'm, you know, I can't even remember uh, how I came across the idea to start these things. But, you know, there's, there's just so many different things that you can think about. You know, I mean, uh, I've got the password tracking log book you know, and then uh, conversations with my therapist. I've had people comment about that. Uh, tracking my weight loss or gain. And for writers, uh, my writer's block diary is a good one. You know, it, it's uh, it's to help you get unstuck from whatever is happening, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've sent that to several of my writer friends. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. Plan B. Plan B is a really special uh, little book uh, and a screenplay. Uh, I actually wrote that uh, a long time ago. I cannot, let me think over here, let's see. In the early 2000s, I wrote that. And uh, it's a very dark comedy. And uh, it has... Uh, it has basically done pretty well in some competitions. Uh, it was a log line winner in the Talentville Battle of the Log Lines. Uh, here's the log line for my dark comedy plan B. A family's rationality snaps after trying to deal with their out of control teenager. They, de they decide it's time for plan B. Kill the little bastard and get away with it. Ooh. Okay. But basically, it, it's just a, uh, it's an intervention. Okay. I see. I yeah. See. They don't kill them. They, in the beginning, they are crazed. They, the family is just absolutely crazed from putting up with all this stuff. And uh, they get a little unbalanced, but they, uh, they have a, uh, a psychologist or, you know, a psychiatrist who straightens them out. How about this one over here? Standing dead. Okay, so that, that's a drama and a tragedy, okay? And uh, the log line for that is jealousy, lies, greed, and desire. Alex discovers too late that secrets can kill. And uh, basically it's uh, about four people, Alex, Chelsea, Philip, and Donna, who are uh, uh, college friends whose lives are really you know tight together. And uh, what happens is, uh, so Alex is with Chelsea and Philip is really not with Donna. Philip is, uh, is a, he's in the closet. He's completely gay. And uh, Alex and he are lovers. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Alex doesn't really want to be considered gay. So he, uh, you know, he just lives in his own little denial. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And then he and Chelsea uh, end up getting married and they have two children and Philip dies from AIDS. And then Alex has the, uh, Alex has to talk to Chelsea about what, what he's brought home, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, oh, uh, Nice. Yeah. So it, it's it's a very, you know, deep thing, you know, and uh, I wrote this a very long time ago, back in 1999, it won the Women in Film and Television Screenwriting Competition. But the uh, the woman that, that uh, oh gosh, uh, I did a consultation with before I won that, she told me this will be a very hard sell. You know, but it is one of those types of screenplays that would be really good as an introduction to your writing because okay. there's strength in the writing. I see something called um, the Last Dog series. There's one here, uh, book two, Tex Mexona. Yeah, the the Last Dog series uh, is is basically uh, it's set in uh, 2086. It's a dystopian series. And it's at the point in time where after many years of, uh, you know, birth control and sperm inhibitors and all this, hardly any women can have children. Okay. And so, I mean, it veers off. It's not anything like the planet of the apes, trust me on this, but dogs are the new children. And uh, it's about Bill and Teresa Maxwell and their dog Lilith, and then uh, her surviving puppy called Abby. Uh, Bill is a uh, an engineering genius, and he develops what's called the dot. The dot is in the wrist, and the dot for humans uh, carries all their financial, their their complete history. And uh, you use your dot going to the store to buy purchases and things like that. Uh, and then Bill develops one for dogs. And uh, there's a speaker through the, I, I guess it's the larynx, I can't remember. So dogs can speak. And it's not like one of those stupid pull toy things, you know, mm -hmm. my name is Kane. You know, they actually speak in in sentences and and all that. And uh, so there's a disaster that happens. This uh, chemical gets loose from a lab. One's in uh, Colorado and one's in China. And anything that is outside is dead. And uh, so there's, you know, gliders. Uh, and this is in the era where we have gliders, no more roads. So gliders are crashing. People are outside. Their dogs, you know, are always with them. And so what it boils down to, there's like uh, four or five dogs that are left in the world alive. And everybody but Abby, the six-week-old puppy that belongs to uh, Bill and Teresa Maxwell, she's the only surviving dog. And then, of course, you know, the government wants her. Yeah. And they take her and she goes to a lab and then she meets uh, the, these robotic dogs and uh, Rex becomes her very best friend. So it, it's a really great series, uh, you know, and you get through, you know, how uh, The Last Dog ends, and then it goes into the second book, Tex Mexona, where Abby is reunited with her family. Here's another one, The God Child, another screenplay. Yeah, I love that. I really do. I love that uh, screenplay. It's an action adventure, and it's about this baby that is born in a hospital. Uh, her mother dies in birth, but her mother, uh, after she gave birth, she begs the doctor to get in touch with her sister, Lily, and not let the government take the baby. You know, the doctors are, what, you know? Yeah. And so... Uh, Basically, an alert comes over at the hospital. Any doctor that, you know, uh, delivers a child, uh, they must get the uh, the mother or, you know, get the umbilical cord and get, you know, blood from the mother and all this other stuff. Yeah. And uh, so shortly after 
Deidre is born, uh, animals start showing up. There's birds and there's squirrels and mice and everything else. And they, they line her incubator. And then outside the window, down on the street, there's animals looking up. Yeah. I guess they're feeling the vibes, right? Yeah. And so the government does come. They take the baby. And, uh, you know, she's brought to a facility that's in the woods. And uh, as she grows up, okay, she, uh, somewhere around four years old, uh, nobody can touch her. If they touch her without, you know, uh, insulated gloves, they're dead. Oh. I mean, it, it's it's one of my favorite scripts. Well, we're going to wrap this up. But before we do, I'm going to put you full frame. And I want you to think about, of all the books that we talked about, and even the ones we didn't talk about, people may be thinking about, hey, what books do, do I want to buy for my summer holidays, my vacation, where I'm putting my feet up, I'm going to read a book. And why should they buy one of your books? Are you ready to give that pitch? They are very entertaining. That's all I can tell you. It's like if they want a, a really light read, they should read the Cats is Cat series. It's uh, set in a small town called Twinkle, Texas in Starlight County, which is 385 miles from the closest shopping mall. It is out there in the country and uh, it's very entertaining. There's three books in that series now. I hope everybody likes it, you know, and they get something out of it. Yeah, I think they will. You've been a delightful guest. And you're right. welcome back anytime as you write right. more books. Get a hold of me, call me up, and we'll get you back in here for season four. All righty. That sounds excellent. And right. you know, if, if I can give you any books, just let me know. I'm the owner of them, so I can send you an EPUB or a PDF if you'd okay. like to write, read something. All right. Thanks a lot, Doug. You take care of yourself now. Thanks. You too. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching. If you like what I do here on Tell Me About Your Book, then please consider hitting that like button and leaving a comment. You can also subscribe and ring that bell because I release two episodes per week, one on Wednesdays, and one on Saturdays. And if you are an author, I would love to hear from you. Until such time, keep on writing and be kind to one another.